This podcast is brought to you by Podspot Events. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Able Pod. My daughter's not going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. As a mum, you are constantly blaming yourself. You feel hopeless. You feel lost, alone, isolated. What percentage of these nerves in, in, your, in your lovely daughter's spinal cord got severed? He ended up severing 90%. That's how affected she was. You must be asking yourself, my God, have we done the right thing? This is irreversible. So my understanding is this operation is considered illegal in Australia, is that right? Definitely, yeah, definitely. And it honestly, it just it makes me so emotional because I just wish that this was in Sydney. But what breaks my heart is the amount of kids that need this. It's those kids that are missing out. I think the listeners are just going to be amazed at your strength. Everything that we've done has been backed up with a huge amount of research. And if I can help other people get there through the success of my daughter's journey, then that is, that is brilliant. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Able Pod. Today, I'd love to extend a really warm welcome to Libby Lombardo. Hey, Libby. Hi, thank you. It's so good to have you here. Thank you for coming across on a rainy old night and uh, being prepared to share your story with us. Yeah, thank you for having us. I'm really excited to be here. Um, you, for those people that don't know, uh, you've had some media exposure in the past. Uh, you have a daughter named Isabella with cerebral palsy. Uh, you've undergone a couple of a couple of operations. You've published a book. You've been on 60 Minutes. Um, I think that's just important context for people to know as they head into this. Some of them would have caught you along that media journey and and others may not have. Um, Did you want to kick off and tell us about the early days? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's amazing to hear all of that, that, you know, we've done so much media and, you know, um, we've travelled the world and and written a book and and different things, but it didn't always start that way. It was, you know, the first four years i I didn't share one single thing about Isabella's journey. And um, she was born perfectly fine. APCAR results were perfect. And she's three months old and we're, you know, told to go and see a specialist. And I was shocked. And, um, you know, we went down a path of two years of blood tests and scans and MRIs where we just didn't know what was happening. It was an absolute whirlwind. You know, doctors thought she might have had a brain tumour, that she could have had a stroke. So scary. Yeah, you know, um, I'm a first-time mum and I'm on cloud nine and um, it was a lot of disbelief and it's just an absolute whirlwind of what is going on. And as a mum, you are constantly blaming yourself that this was my fault that it had happened what is it that I had done wrong what is it I could have done differently you know and you're very scared of a you know a a label or a diagnosis so I hid it from I hid it from everybody but what I was actually hiding from was myself yeah and I couldn't talk about it with anybody because people would ask me so many questions and I didn't know what the answers were. I was completely lost. So, um, see, the thing is that everyone that has a loved one with disability has gone through something similar. There is there's a time frame where you need to internalise it, and then you you finally make that that decision to it's it's a it's a journey of acceptance, right? Yeah. And, and, then, and then you feel you can talk about it. It really but, is. But but what you're what you're explaining is the longevity that that took for you to come to that realisation and some of the internal thoughts. So I've, I've introed with some of the media coverage, you're taking us back to a time when maybe you didn't even want to acknowledge it. Yeah, absolutely. It was, you know, um, if I ever saw friends or family, they only ever saw me holding Isabella or she was in a pram, so I was very much trying to make out like everything was fine, like I could fix this, I could really make this go away. And, um, you know, because even the doctors didn't even know Mm. what was going on before we got a diagnosis. Yeah. 
And as crazy as it was, we actually, after all the specialist appointments, doctor's appointments, we had a physiotherapist come to the house one day and say to me, oh, she's got cerebral palsy. Yeah, okay. And at that moment, you're like, what are you, what are you talking, like I've never even heard of that before, what are, you, what are you talking about? And I was so angry with her. You took it out on her immediately. She left that elephant mm. in the room and exited. And... To look back on it now, it feels um, stupid, but at the time it was just... Oh, there's no doubting there's emotion at play. It's huge. You're yeah. a very protective mother and it's a huge paternal instinct. Um, like, who are you to exactly. say that about my daughter? How just dare you? Just come into my house when I'm seeing doctors and specialists and she's like, oh, she's got cerebral palsy. Nonchalantly. Yeah. Okay, that was a heavy day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all a journey. Uh, that day, talk me through it. A label that, that I you stayed didn't up. Want. I stayed up that night just Googling cerebral palsy. And, you know, I, at this stage, we had to stop all the um, blood tests and scans and MRIs. We had to draw a line and say, we just have to stop and we have to get Isabella some help. Yeah. And this physiotherapist comes in and is like, I was just at rock bottom, like literally at rock bottom. And I was up all night Googling and wanting to just get Isabella some help. Like, where can I help get her muscles stronger? Like, what is it that I can do to help her? Because all of that was kind of put on the sideline while you're trying to figure out the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, there was just a long time that you, you don't believe that there's anything wrong, that she doesn't have cerebral palsy. She's going to be fine. Denial? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And... Probably, you know, the most confronting moment is you've got this little four-year-old. She can't walk. She can't crawl. She can't even sit up. And they're starting to talk about getting her fitted for a wheelchair. Mm. Mm. That's not your goal as a mum with this tiny little girl but then you're thinking god you know like she wants to be independent she wants to be able to get around mm. and it's just a absolute gut-wrenching moment to get your little four-year-old fitted for you know this little hot pink wheelchair and so, it turns your life upside down so somewhere in you there is a there is a fighter right so mm. you, you actually don't accept the hot pink wheelchair just verbatim you're just like no nah. I don't think so. So it was all temporary. We'll just get the wheelchair just until we get it all sorted, just until we figure oh, it out. Oh, you'd accept it as a temporary just, measure yeah. while you got everything yeah. else. Yeah, well, everything on was track. just gonna be temporary. Okay. Mm. Oh, that was not a forever thing, no way. I went to the uh, cerebral palsy alliance and yeah. they called me in this very important meeting. And they said, um, they clearly pointed to a chart and said, this is where Isabella is, you know, and they clearly pointed to the, the wheelchair. Hang on, hang on. Let's have a run go, through go this chart. Here. What is it? A spectrum of, uh, from someone with a cane or someone. Exactly. So it's all the it? different, yeah. um, uh, levels of cerebral palsy. Yeah. So. Um, they pointed to a chart, you know, at the furthest end of like her life in a wheelchair. And it was, you know, I remember just being this serious meeting where they called me down there and they had a, um, a counselor in the room with us as well to be like, let's break the news. Like this is pretty much, you know, Isabella's lifelong diagnosis and how is she kind of going to take it? And it honestly, at that moment, they pointed to the wheelchair and they're like, oh, do you want to come and, you know, talk to the counsellor and sit down and chat with them? And I was like, no. You know, I've got to get home. Mm -hmm. I'm going to research how my daughter's not going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. So there it is. You didn't accept the diagnosis. Your first instinct is to run out of there, not talk to the counsellor and go into, 
acceptance and grievance and whatever, it's actually to go on the front foot, start researching and figure out what can be done. Something can be done to get Isabella to live her best life possible. No matter what it was, that's what we wanted for her. Yeah. So for the first four years, all we did was watch Isabella progressively get worse and okay. worse. Okay, so she's going backwards. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So the the mum fighter kicks in. Where does this come from? What support have you got? Do you mm. even know what you're going to do when you leave the office, determined to not have your daughter in a wheelchair? Lost beyond belief. Like, completely lost. I've got no resources. I've got no contacts. I've got no people I can call. Like, this was a completely lonely, solo journey. It's like I couldn't even tell my family mm. about what I was going through. Okay. Yeah. So a very, a very lonely, mentally demanding journey. It is very lonely where, and isolating. Where does the fortitude come from? And why there didn't, would why be, didn't you pack it in? Why didn't you give up and become a victim? Oh, look, maybe I've, I've probably had snippets of being a victim. <laughs> You know, when you, you just uh, ha have those days. But um, you know where it comes from is the love you have for a child. Like no matter what it is, if a parent sees that their child is struggling to hold their pen correctly and they can't write at school or they're not socialising with their friends, that parent wants to help that child. No matter how small it is, it's so important or how big it is. It's like as a mum, as a, as a parent, you just love this little thing beyond belief. You just want to do every single thing you can to make their life amazing. And so many parents can represent with that feeling of wanting to help their child, whether they can't read properly or spell or... Um, no matter what it is, you just want to be able to help them. And for me, I suppose it felt like it was a, it was a, on a massive level. It was a huge thing. Mm. Mm. She's in pain. That, that was a very, very strong answer to that question. That was drawing from the depths of your emotion. And I think that absolutely nailed it. Mm. A mother's love. Yeah. So what do you do with that? It's, it's raw love and passion. You need to back it up with something. What do you go in search of? I'm searching desperately for answers. The doctors are telling us that there's nothing that they can do, that there's, um, it's just painful ongoing injections at the children's hospital, so we'd have to go every few months to the children's hospital. She'd get 20 to 30 injections. Mm. and Botox. Yeah, to... Relieve the tension in her yeah. her arms and her legs. And how much relief would she get? Oh, you know, it was quite it was quite temporary. There was a little bit of relief because, for example, just to give the view uh, the listeners a understanding, her muscles are tense, so they're mm -hmm. on. So it's like when you go to walk and your muscles are on. Hers are on all the time, mm. and as she grows, um, the spasticity she has in her muscles it. Uh, destroys the bodies and it progressively gets worse okay. naturally right as the, as the body grows it just becomes more and more distorted with her joints so this is why we're watching her progressively get worse so the botox injections would just help alleviate yeah some of that stress that was on a body that was on her muscles but this is temporary yeah the botox wears off how much it works and we're talking about take. large muscle groups too, and right? Then, we're not talking about little facial muscle groups. So we're talking about a, a yeah. decent-sized needle, lots of injections. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and a relief period of what, a month, two months, three months? Yeah, maybe maybe that, you know, like 10 weeks, 8, 10, 12 weeks. Yeah. But as she gets more and more of these injections, eventually she'll become immune to it and it doesn't work anymore. So okay. it's, a, it's a temporary fix. And this was a, a Band-Aid. It's a Band-Aid yeah. on the real problem. And there's no solution to how we can fix this. So every doctor's appointment, 
every physio appointment that I went to, I'd ask other parents, I'd say, what is the best thing that you've done to be able to help your child? And it might have been a swimming class, it might have been a different type of physio that I didn't know about, and we were just trying everything. Yeah. I was asking every single doctor, what is it that we can do to help Isabella, Isabella get better? You're actively asking oh, everyone I, that you come across, waiting rooms, strangers doctors. In, yeah, and I'd see the child go up and talk to them. What, what, what can we... You're in pursuit of something. What have, what have you done? Have you done anything to be able to help your daughter, Sally? Yeah. You know, get this far and they'd be like, oh, you know, excited about some kind of, some idea and we would get the number and actively pursuing it. Every doctor I spoke to, every physician. And you feel hopeless. You feel lost, alone, isolated. And I went to the Randwick Children's Hospital one day. Mm -hmm. We're in the waiting room for Isabella's routine injections. She's got all her little bandages on with her um, the numbing cream and everything. And we're in the waiting room and we're sitting opposite another mum and dad. And they said to us, again, I asked the question, what's the best thing that you've done? And, and they said that they're going to America to go and have a surgery that was called selective dorsal rhizotomy. Okay. That's a mouthful. Tell us yeah. more. Well, for short, SDR, but selective dorsal rhizotomy. Yeah. And they were telling me how this could help their son get out of pain. It could help him stand up. It could help him get stronger. It could help him get better. So I was like, wow, like, that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. This is something. This is incredible. This is mind blowing. They pointed me to a Facebook page yeah. from people all around the world going for this surgery in the United States. Okay. And I'm like, wow, like we have some hope. Yeah. Finally. Yeah, for sure. So I'm beside myself, right, to go into the doctor's appointment. Oh, you're taking this information in with you straight away. Oh, yeah. So we're, we're going in to go and uh, have a meeting with the yeah. head of the children's hospital who heads up the unit there of the pain management and the cerebral um, palsy. Okay. And, and you table this. You, you, you rush this. You're like, you're like, we want this. Straight away, I want, I want to go in and, and talk to the specialist about this surgery. Can this be for Isabella? Is this something that can help her? Yeah. And we went through the appointment and I'll just like never forget going to ask that doctor about the surgery for Isabella. And he turned around and he just was like, no, this is not for her. We don't see that she is a candidate for this. And then he started to go on and tell us some like really negative outcomes of the surgery. And I'm like, you know, crushing, like I'm just dying because yeah. I was like excited. Um, and it was just gut wrenching to be like, okay, but hang on, this is a surgery that I understand is performed in America. Uh, it is incredibly specialist. There's a lot of technology involved. However, this doctor believes that he can. Yep. Not a candidate. It's not, you're, not only you're not, not a candidate, but mm. he, has, he has negative stories associated yeah. with the surgery. Some negative okay. stories of people who have had the surgery and really negative outcomes. Okay. Um, and so, and Isabella wasn't the right age to have it. He, he told us a whole list of things about why. All of which were negative. All very negative, yeah. The roller coaster continues. Roller coaster continues. And I couldn't stop thinking about what those parents told me in the waiting room about their little boy. Mm -hmm. So I stuck to that Facebook page like glue. And it's I called watched, hope. You hang on to it, right? Hanging on to it. Yeah. We've got nothing else. <laughs> what else have we got? You know? Um, and so I'm following this Facebook page and I watch firsthand this little boy go for the surgery. And I'm messaging parents from all around the world about them going for the surgery and, and trying to compare them to Isabella, like how similar were they to her and is this for Isabella and how come this is for them? Yeah. How come it's working on that child? We watched that little boy go for the surgery. The boy that you met in the waiting room? Little way. boy Finn. Yeah. And three months recovery and then you start watching him walking. Mm. And you just, we were completely blown away. So we decided for ourselves to say, like, let's see if we think that this surgery is possible for Isabella. Yeah. And we applied for the surgery 
directly with a hospital in the United States. Okay. It was a really thorough process. We had to send off videos and of Isabella and um, all quite different reports and, and different things. And we had to wait four weeks for the result. Yeah. And we finally got the email through. And again, you're looking for like that hope. Yeah. It's like... That she'll be accepted. It was almost like Isabella's life depended yeah. on that email coming through. So he's looking at the videos for certain things. How much space does so he he's how, looking... how much How much he can alleviate in terms of that journey towards walking? He is looking to see if she qualifies for the surgery. So yeah. Dr. Park in the United States who does the surgery will only accept people into the surgery that he believes that will have a positive outcome. Mm-hmm. So to date, he's done over 5,000 surgeries and every one of them has been successful. But people do get knocked back from the surgery. Okay. Uh, if they don't qualify and he doesn't foresee that it's going to have a positive outcome, they do get knocked back. So as I'm following this Facebook page, I'm seeing people apply, some getting accepted and some not. So I don't know what category I'm going to fit into. So we're just like, we don't know. It's just right. It was like a lottery ticket. <laughs> Tiny bits of information. Yeah. It sounds like hell. So we okay. apply for the surgery. And after four weeks, we get the email and it comes through. That's it's, positive. She's a successful candidate. We see nothing but positive outcomes for Isabella and a very positive future. And he went on to list how well she would do after the surgery. He is a doctor that like puts it on the line. You know when you go for a doctor's appointment and they're so yeah. vague and yes. they won't tell you anything? Yes. When you speak to this doctor in America, he is just so thorough with like, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. This is how it's going to look. He owns it. Owns it. He's 100% responsible. He's yeah. done his research. He knows his field. Mm. He's a specialist. He's done it 5,000 times. So every doctor was against us in Australia. Yeah. Um, and mostly people had no idea about the surgery that even existed, even physiotherapists. I'm like, here's this surgery that can help turn this child's life around. And all of that physiotherapy is pretty much useless without the surgery. Right. I was like, do you want to learn about this? Do you want to know about this groundbreaking? But a lot of people were very, very closed off to wanting to know about this life-changing surgery. So is this once you'd been there and had the surgery and came back and you wanted the world to change because you could see the change or is this it was on all, the way it over? Was, or it was went? before yep. it, and, of course, even more so after. Yeah. So we saved over a hundred and twenty thousand dollars to go to America of our own money. We Amazing. refinanced our home. We yeah, this um, is incredible. This is the financial aspect. Yeah, the disability 000. that people don't see. Mm. There's no, and no online funding thing. There's no none of, none of the big bodies decided to chip in. What you're doing is considered high risk. Maybe people don't want to be associated with it. This is you, yeah, and your husband mm-hmm. going there. Yeah, remortgaging your house. Yes, and we did have a few like donations and we did sausage sizzles and yeah. tried to raise money every which way. Okay, so somehow you get to the States, you pay the fees, what happens then? We go, you know, for three months, we pack up life in Sydney as such and we take, I've got a, a little seven-month-old baby boy and Isabella who's four years old. To, the, to America and you know we felt so unsupported and you were never really like oh you know are we doing the right thing it was like as much as we'd done all the research and we knew this was what we had to do for Isabella you can't help but you know when she was wheeled into that surgery five hour surgery And there's no turning back after, you know, they sever the nerves of the spinal cord and it's a permanent sever. So you're very scared. It's incredible, incredibly scared. It's an irreversible (laughs) surgery. Mm. Irreversible. Uh, Just just so the listeners understand, my, my sort of understanding is that they somehow check each individual nerve and if it is, uh, 
involved in the spasticity, mm -hmm. then they may sever it to relieve the muscle tension. And then the brain will somehow rewire and develop a connection with that muscle. Yeah. And, the, and, and in theory, she's learning to walk again. Exactly. You've researched it very well. So how many, how, what percentage of these nerves in, in, your, in your lovely daughter's spinal cord got severed? The crazy thing was after the surgery, the, the doctor, the surgeon came in to talk to us and said he ended up severing 90% of her spinal cord. That's how affected she was. He ended up severing 90%. Of those 90%. nerves, yeah. He left 10% that was good, and it was on that 10% that she had never used before because they override. So she had to start on a whole new platform. So she was starting again. This is how scary the Hang surgery on. was. You and your husband have been brave enough to take your daughter over there. The doctor says to you that I've severed 90% of the functional nerves connecting your daughter's body. She's running on 10%. Mm. You're in the waiting room, you hear this news. You must be asking yourself, my God, have we done the right thing? This is irreversible. Yeah. Isn't this too much pressure for one person to take? Yeah. Where, 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 was the, where did the fortitude come from? Where, where, where's the faith? Everyone was against you. Yeah, I think, you know, I was very blessed that my partner at the time, Isabella's dad, was very, very supportive we were a team that really stuck together and forged forward through this. He did extensive amounts of research and we just didn't see any other hope for Isabella. We didn't want to see her get worse and worse yeah. over yeah. time and we didn't want to see the Band-Aid injections that keep going to continue. So... You know, we, we just had to do something. We had to put all of our faith and trust in this incredible doctor. And thankfully, you know, after a five-hour surgery, she comes out. And even just touching her legs after the surgery felt like yours and, and mine, just that tender, supple... Which you'd never felt before. They were always on. They were always locked. Always tense, yeah. always on. And her legs were splayed out. Just For like the first time. New. First time. We were we were crazy, just like, wow, this is a miracle. All that tension was relieved in her legs. Amazing. But I think the listeners are just gonna be amazed at your strength at this point in the chat. I I really do. I think you and your husband had a special bond to go through that. Not yeah. everyone would put themselves through that. Mm. I can't think of many couples that would go through that? It's incredible because people always said to me, oh, you know, you're such an incredible mum or, you know, but, and I never, I never saw it and I still don't. You're living it. Really? Because you're, you, you're living it and I didn't see any other way. It was always what I was going to do. Yeah. But I can tell you when I got to the US and I met other parents that had made it there for that surgery, they were fighters. And I saw it in them. Yeah. They had come from all different places from around the world and had given up everything to get their child there for that surgery. It was that was incredible. I did see when I when I went to the US those people that made it, I saw the fight in them. But really the hero is Isabella, you know, with what she went through and how she fought through that surgery. And she had to come through and they, and she had to go through uh, four weeks of intensive therapy straight from that surgery every day. So it doesn't end. It's not a surgery. and you To magically... get the body moving and that, yeah. that so was gut-wrenching. You start from, from Scratch. zero. Yeah. Mind trying to send messages to muscles, trying mm. to create some sort of connection, mm. start moving forward, first mm. step. Mm. Okay, so how much how much uh, therapy are we are we going through, and where are you living during this time? Do you need to be close to the hospital? Is it outsourced? Yeah, we we um, Isabella was in hospital for a few weeks, yep. recovering, and then after that we moved to an apartment close by to the hospital, so we could travel there every day, and we would go back every day for two hours of intensive therapy. Yeah, and through the pain and 
everything that Isabella had gone through, the main thing was to get her body up and moving straight away. Right. Yeah. Tough gig for a little child. Oh. Huge surgery. The worst. First thing yeah. you got to do is get back up. And yeah. Start and walk those through muscles. the pain. Yeah. Don't walk through the pain. And she's screaming and crying and yeah. You know, you can't explain to this little child and you're halfway across the world and you're still just thinking, oh my God, like, what am I, what am I doing? And just eventually, you know, we just stuck with it and she just got better and better and better. Awesome. And the results have been mind blowing. Okay. So she let's can, fast forward, we come back from the States. How, how's it all go down? Like you're back here, you've got a daughter, she's progressing. Do you, do you want to tell some of the authorities that what you've done? Do you, do you want to say, guys, look, look what we've been able to achieve. You need to acknowledge this. Yeah, we get back to Sydney and we went and saw the doctor who was against her surgery. And he saw her in a walking frame, yeah. standing up, taking steps, running. And he was just like, well, we'd have to say it was a roaring success, wouldn't we? That's what he said? Mm-hmm. It's exact words, yeah. With no skin in the game, he sat on the sideline, watched, but acknowledged that it was a roaring success. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, you're going to tell me about Isabella now. Let's, let's, let's talk about before surgery, after surgery, some of the wins, some of the gains that mm. are attributable to you and your husband's bravery. Her gains are just outstanding. Just the, the, the fact that she can put both of her feet flat yeah. on the floor. Yeah, for sure. Was incredible because before they were quite splayed up and on tippy toes. And yeah. So she can she can stand up, her legs are straight, she's taking steps. She is she's got freedom. But the best thing, Ian, was after the surgery, Isabella, we watched her progressively getting better and better and better. Okay. And Every time we went for physiotherapy, no matter what it was, it was rewarding. The graph's heading in the right and direction. You're, yeah, you're and not now, going backwards. Yeah, Isabella's enjoying the therapy because she's seeing results. Yeah, and, and she's not getting any injections. That... Yes, yeah, no more, no more 30 injections every few months. That, that's finished. Okay. So... At any stage along this journey, do you take a break? Do, do, do you acknowledge what you've done? Or was it just, you're living it, it's day in, day out, there's no holidays, you're a mother of a child with a disability, there's no time out. And a newborn. And a newborn by this yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. Joseph comes along. Mm. Okay, so there's no break, there's no let up. And there's actually not that acknowledge that much acknowledgement. Remember, the, the film crew weren't with you on this. This was a very lonely, yeah. family-based undertaking, yeah, right? Yeah, we were by ourselves on this trip, yeah. Okay. So all these remarkable things mm. kind of you, you and your peer group know about, but... Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's phase one. Phase two, you're always looking for the next thing. Talk, us about, talk to us about the next part of the journey. Yeah, so, you know, once you see some light like that, yeah. you're thinking, well, what else is it? What else is out there that we don't know about yeah. that can potentially help her? And... You know, stem cells is something that we have always been interested in, but we knew that we had to do this surgery before we could even look at stem cells. So we right. had to wait for Isabella to fully heal uh, and get better. And again, my partner, we forged forward together as a great team. Uh, he started researching. Yeah huge amounts of reports and papers on stem cells from all around the world and people getting results that have the same condition as Isabella. He's churning through Google yeah. in search of answers. Mm. He's, He's obviously a detail-oriented guy. He was reading um, studies and reports that had been done from mainly Duke University. Okay. So can we tell the listeners about stem cells? I didn't know anything about them before I read your book. Mm. I'll have my novice attempt. In stem cells are groundbreaking. Yeah, are they? Oh, ab absolutely. They're in your body everywhere or just in your bone marrow? Well, we're all made up of, uh, of, of stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that they work is that you can go for all different types of stem cells. Mm -hmm. 
And when you go for the treatment of stem cells, it will go into the body and it will heal that part of the body that has uh, inflammation or that needs healing, mm -hmm. that has damage done to it. Okay. And that's the, that's the miracle of stem cells, but it's also the gamble because you don't know how much it's going to help. And then there's so many different types of stem cells that you can do. So you can do your own stem cells or you can do donor stem cells. Okay. So stem cells was something we were definitely always interested in. Uh, after the surgery, we kind of felt like that was the, the next step. And we wanted to do this as well, especially while Isabella was still young. And we did the research mainly on the Duke University research papers about what was working. And we decided to go for bone marrow stem cells. And in all places, we went to Mexico. Okay. Mm. So my understanding is this operation is considered illegal in Australia. Is that right? Definitely, yeah. Definitely. It's not only not favoured, it's actually illegal. Yeah. Okay, so once again, you decide to defy the odds, mm. get a whole bunch of cash and head off to Mexico. Yeah. In search of what? What stem cells do is they will treat the body and they'll go to the part of the body that has inflammation or damage. So Isabella uh, had uh, a certain type of brain damage. So she had been caused a, a brain damage. And those stem cells, we were in hope that they would go through the body and go to the inflammation in the brain and start to try to heal that part of the brain for her. I like it. I can see it. So oh. this was a real gamble. We didn't know how much it was going to work or not work. But this is what the studies and the research was that we had backed up and that's what we were aiming for. So we actually just me and Isabella were heading to Mexico to the most remote part, like the most non-touristy part of Mexico. Okay. <laughs> Nobody spoke a word of English. It was like, they just looked at us like, what are you doing in this part of Mexico? Like it's not Cabo San Lucas at all. And it's 10 days before we're about to fly. I'm, go I'm gonna go by myself and I get a call from 60 Minutes and they were interested in the story and heard that we were flying to Monterey for stem cells and they wanted to come over and talk to me. They came over that day, the producer. Okay, they and jumped on it. They, yeah. They, they could smell the story. Yeah, and I was just, you know, I'm quite scared the fact that I'm going to Mexico by myself. It's Absolutely. overwhelming. We've just gotten back from this surgery and um, I'm thinking, okay, well, they just want to come over and talk about it. Nothing's going to really happen. Yeah. And after, you know, two hour discussion, she went back to the office and called me like an hour later saying, how do, how do I feel about, um, you know, six crew coming to Mexico with me to cover the story? And I was like, wow, like, you know, that, that was incredible. So, But you wouldn't have known what angle they were going to cover, what six crew would look like on site. Are they prohibitive are they, are yeah. they are they messing with you and your daughter mm. is it cameras everywhere do you lose all your privacy so all of these questions go through your mind right mm. Mm. but somehow you go yep yeah. yeah well that's right we didn't know whether the angle because you can't control the media whether the angle was going to be you know what this girl is doing is crazy for her daughter or yep. what this girl is doing you know what this family is doing is really supportive for their daughter so you never really we didn't know until we sat down and you hear the tick tick Isabella Lombardo and her family go to Mexico and the story was so beautiful. They That's were it. very supportive and they could see we had done extensive amounts of research and that the place that we were going to was very creditable and we achieved, again, great results. Amazing. And the film crew added to your support network, as I understand it. Really yeah, we became, became... we became family. Which is a beautiful outcome, right? Mm. That's when you know they were there to support the right. me. Two o'clock in the morning when Isabella's yeah. vomiting, they were there to go and get the medicine for me to help, and it was really wonderful. Yeah, they were they were great. I think sixty minutes were very much, you know, like what very much on our side as far as you know. Here's this family from Sydney, yeah, that have to pack up and spend all this money and fly to Mexico for this groundbreaking treatment. Like, it just feels wrong. Like, why is this not 
in yeah. Australia. Yeah, for sure. That was very much their angle. So tell us about some of the gains that Isabella received after the stem cell treatment. We've harvested stem cells. We've put them through the spinal cord into the brain. You're hoping it's going to repair some damage, which has been there since birth, right? Yeah. You're hoping for a miracle. Mm. You've done all your research. What, what happens? What, what's the upside? I'm in Mexico, and it's literally 24 hours after the stem cells, and I get Isabella out of bed to try to walk her to the bathroom. And as soon as she stood up, the difference was just like the strength in her body was like, I'm thinking, am I imagining this? Because nothing's really graded or nothing's really guaranteed. It's all kind of on a whim. And I'm like, okay, that's a big difference in her body, strength. And so I don't tell any of these results to the, my, my husband at the time. And when I got because it's almost too good to be true, you yeah. just you just self. But I was al almost like, okay, you see when you get home, yeah, and see what you think. And then as soon as I got back to Sydney, yeah, he was just like, wow. He could feel it too. And I said, yep, that's these are parents that yeah. have handled their child so thousands he, of times. Yeah, you can tell. You can the tell straight away. Yeah, yeah. The, the difference in her body. Yeah. And the way that she was able to stand and her strength. One of the hugest results that we've had. And it honestly, it just, it makes me so emotional because I just wish that this was in Sydney, like, and we need to go for more stem cells. We got cut off with COVID being able to, you know, there's so many people. You want to go back? And so many stories from around the world of people that missed out on treatment because of COVID that can't get treatment, you know, with where they live and they have to travel abroad. It's heartbreaking. We, of course, yeah, but Isabella's thumb was quite locked in like that. Yeah. Stem cells like that. Oh, really? Mm. Not the, the previous operation, the, the, the more No, that had, that had nothing to do. That, that first surgery was just purely for her legs. Right. So this, this was not going to do anything to the rest of her. So it's doing something in yeah. her brain. Yeah, so her, her thumb was quite locked in. Yeah. And then now it's like that. But the difference that makes, like I, I would do that all over again just for that result because okay. it means she can hold a pen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what it means? She can clap. Yeah. How much she just wanted to clap, make that noise. Before, she couldn't clap. She was so annoyed. She's like, you do it all I, again for a clap. I want to clap. Yeah. And she gets back, she's like, I can clap. Uh, I will pay that again. Send me just to Mexico for stem cells so my daughter can clap. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well and we done. were clapping all the way. Of course so, you were. Yeah, the results that we saw, and I, I saw quite, you know, significant other results. So we said, let's go back again, and we went back to Mexico for a second time. She struggled massively with constipation, like, yeah. like traumatic, almost hospitalized over right. constipation because her internal organs are not as strong as ours to yeah. be able to go to the toilet. Sure. This is terrible and, and unmanageable, and we're, we're going through this. Yeah. You know, every few months with her. Yeah. The second time we go for stem cells, it has never happened since. She has never had a traumatic experience with constipation again. So good. So you tell me that stem cells don't work. Not one doctor in Sydney was supportive to us to go for stem cells. You were on your own. We were told we were bad parents. My God. We were on our own. And, you know, it's... Time and time again, you're reading so many results about stem cells. But what breaks my heart is the amount of kids that need this, the amount of kids that need that surgery that she had, and those parents, they just don't have the strength or the finances or the courage or the support network to be able to make it for that surgery. So it's those kids that are missing out that's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And in 20 years' time, people are going to laugh at the fact that we flew to Monterey for stem cells. You think it's going to be like that? Because it's going to be here. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Why are you so confident? How do you, how... Because it works. And what are the side effects? Do you know now burn victims, when their skin is, needs to be regrafted, they now have stem cells they spray in a can and it's regrowing skin like it's groundbreaking. They're growing organs with stem cells. We've gone through a technology change with um, in the last 10, 20 years, right? We've seen change astronomical with technology. Yeah. You wait and see the next 10, 20 years, the change we're going to see with health and with stem cells. It's going to, it's just going to, it's going to change the world of health.
You're passionate about this, I can yeah, tell. This and is it, a thing. And, and it's, you know, I don't want that to be too late for my daughter. I don't want to wake up in 20 years' time and say, oh, there's something I could have done. Like, this needs to be here now for Isabella. This needs to be here now for other kids to help them live their best life. And, you know, it's, it's really groundbreaking. And if I can get behind any way to expedite stem cells coming to Australia, I'm in. Essentially, you're talking about the body repairing itself. Yeah. This, this master cell creating other cells, repairing damaged parts of the body. Inflammation in the I, body. I don't see the objection with the authorities to make this an illegal undertaking. What? Everything I don't want to get into to too through much through of that. Yep. A process. Right. Everything has to go through a procedure. And that, you know, credit to Australian doctors. And that is why sometimes we do have some groundbreaking medicine here. And some we do have some groundbreaking surgeries in Australia. But do we have progress with cerebral palsy? I, I haven't seen any progress yeah. that has happened in the last 20 years. Like, what are they doing that is groundbreaking for cerebral palsy? Yeah. Well, I think they're playing it safe. Yeah. I think they probably We're don't playing want it either. safe too. <laughs> you're playing it safe? Yeah. You think that what you're doing is playing it safe? Well, we know what we know now. We didn't know what we knew then. But everything that we've done has been backed up with a huge amount of research. Like we didn't yeah. just go on a whim. We went off like uh, results. So they've been studying this for eight years at the Duke University um, this type of stem cells and showing the results. But Australia won't bring those results here and work off that. They want to start from scratch again. So we're, we're even eight years behind the progress of where they are at the Duke University of those results. Okay. So that's what is frustrating. So you're on the board of uh, a body looking to introduce stem cells in Australia. This is a, this is a huge the, thing for you. This is SDR in Australia, selective dorsal rhizotomy. I work with a board in Australia because of my daughter's results. That was the first operation? Yeah. Okay. They're looking to bring that to Australia. Really? Mm-hmm. And any ideas of time frame or it's caught up with bureaucracy or... Bureaucracy and it takes a very, very long time and I'm glad I'm not still just waiting around for that surgery to come here. Yeah, no, it wouldn't happen in, in your yeah. daughter's time frame. The stem cell thing, which you seem to be even more passionate about. We're looking for government grants to get that surgery brought here. So it's about the government wanting to fund, to fund it. Where are they going to put the money and where are they going to put the money with stem cells? Because it all comes down to money. And the Stem Cell Institute, who I love the girls that work there, I love the research that they're doing. They're just as passionate about it as me. They know what we've done. They know the results. But they need funding. But they on, need there's backing. Funding. There's funding out there. Hmm. Are you frustrated by the lack of progress? Are you frustrated by the lack of funding? It this... is It is frustrating. We do know that the Cerebral Palsy Alliance do get massive amounts of funding yep. brought through every year. We don't know where that funding goes, but what I do know is that funding does not help Isabella in her lifetime right now at all, zero. So I'm, that's what I know as a mother and as an advocate and a supporter of somebody seeing results. We just have to do what we do now. So, you know, my life has, has turned around dramatically. I went from a broken mess who didn't share her story for the first four years mm -hmm. to now, on the flip side, I share on, you know, social media. I share my story with so many people around the world. So many people have gone for stem cells and the SDR surgery in light of what Isabella has done. And if I can help other people get there through the success of my daughter's journey, then... That is, that is brilliant. Mm. Very, very powerful. That'd be remarkable. I think you're incredibly strong, incredibly resilient. Your journey has been a delight to capture. Thank you. Seriously. And not only have you done it all, have you taken these risks, you've done the research, which people I don't think acknowledge how much time that you and your husband spent looking this up, right? Yeah, we weren't watching Netflix. You... No. We were just so, so you took these risks, you've, mm. you've, you've leaded the world, or certainly Australia, on these two surgeries, and you've backed it up by becoming part of boards, which might not be your, your natural go-to, long bureaucratic processes to try and make change, probably acknowledging that it's not going to help Isabella, it's going to help the next person down the line. Yeah. Just like that little guy that was in the 
in the waiting room that had the surgery with Dr. Park, and you watched him on Facebook, and you said, let's do it. And on a last note, I'd love to, you know, share with you that the very first person that had that surgery with Dr. Park 30 years ago, she says it was the best thing that she's ever done, and today she's a dancer. Wow. It's incredible. That's incredible. That's an incredible result. Mm. Libby, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been remarkable. Uh, it's been emotional at times. Uh, you've been an incredible guest. I think the listeners would love this podcast. Uh, the channel's called Able Pod. It's part of Able Plus. Libby Lombardo, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks.